it was quite surprising to me to get involved in composite machining in depth. It's really all I've been focusing on for a few years now and walk into a uh, area where they are building a high performance plane and see guys drilling holes with hand drills. But that is a pretty common sight when you're looking at a assembly area for aircraft manufacturing. Uh, hand drilling applications really are best suited to something along the lines of one of these two choices. They're both straight flute tools. The top one is our triple angle drill. Uh, the bottom is an uncoated drill reamer. Some people call them dreamers. Oftentimes we can eliminate a separate drill and ream application with one tool, goes straight through the composite, uh, puts it to size without a secondary tool coming in there. Oftentimes these tools are going to have threaded shank adapters, allows the operator to change them out very easily without having it slip in a chuck or something like that. And if you have ever attempted to drill something like a thin piece of sheet metal with a hand drill or a piece of plywood, you know that when you get to the exit side, it tries to rip that drill through the material because of the helix pulling it forward. Well, that could quite possibly scrap a very expensive component for an airplane. This is one of the reasons why we avoid the helical drill design here and go to the straight flute type drill. Next production method would be a pneumatic drilling machine. Pretty specialized. It has speed and feed control within certain limitations. It ten tends to not have a great deal of torque or horsepower, but it is rigidly attached to a fixture, so much better than a hand drill. Since we have both rigidity and feed rate control, we can now go to something a little more complex. In this case, it's a helical twist drill. This one has air or coolant holes going through it to ease some of the heat generation we were talking about. And again, it's diamond coated to allow a much longer tool life. Next production method, fascinating machine, flex track machine, essentially a computer controlled CNC drilling machine that slides around or moves itself around a fuselage and puts holes in, in predetermined locations. Pretty high tech stuff. Good rigidity, good control over feeds and speeds. So now we can start to employ whatever type of design uh, you know, our imaginations come up with here. We have a variety of different multiple point angles here, double margin drills, triple margin drills, different helix angles, depending on what we're trying to achieve. Uh, they are all easily applicable in, an, in a, a situation where we're using a flex track. Lastly, something I think everybody here is probably familiar with now, and that's a CNC machine. Really the best possible way to put holes in any object. And it is going to give us almost infinite control over speeds and feeds, and it is going to give us a great deal of rigidity. Literally at this point, you can use whatever design an engineer is going to create. So what do we make the drill out of? I think a lot of people are probably uh, familiar with high-speed steel tools. There's still a lot of them being used out there in some aerospace applications. We still sell a lot of high-speed steel tools, but in the reality of carbon fiber composites, they are not applicable. They just simply do not have the wear resistance. You may be able to drill a hole, but that tool is not going to last more than maybe a hole or two before the uh, edge wear becomes problematic. Next up is going to be an uncoated carbide, fairly widely applied in composites. Uh, the good thing about an uncoated carbide is it tends to have a very sharp edge. The drawback is, again, due to the abrasive nature of the tool, that edge doesn't last very long. We can prolong the tool life with something like a drill reamer where we spread that wear out over a large surface area of the cutting tool, but ultimately the drawback to carbide is going to be its short tool life. Next up would be a diamond coated carbide tool and this is an area where OSG has put most of its R&D or at least a very significant portion of its R&D. Taking a diamond coated carbide tool allows us to dream up almost any geometry efficiently created in a CNC tool grinder and then simply apply a very highly wear resistant coating to it. It gives us the best of all worlds in that we have the geometry we're looking for it's economical to produce and the coating gives it as much wear resistance as we might hope for. Uh, towards the top of the list we also have PCD tip drills and, and there's two types. There's the wafer type or the conventional braze tip drill, kind of almost two-dimensional. They're used in the industry but they really do not allow for higher radial rake angles and complex shapes because of course you can imagine the cost associated with dining, uh, grinding a diamond PCD tip very difficult so uh, the cost goes up significantly. 
Uh, the final choice would be a vein type or a molded type of PCD tip, and that's widely used in the industry. It has advantages. Uh, one thing that it does not allow for, again, is maybe necessarily the ease of change of design and the ease of manufacturing. Uh, oftentimes, I like to point out when people are considering uh, PCD tip tools that really what you are dealing with is a composite tip on that tool. It's diamond crystals suspended in a binder. So all things being equal in a perfect world, really the pure diamond coating should be more wear resistant. Now both tools have their strengths and weaknesses but we tend to apply the coated tools more often. These two pictures illustrate uh, both a super fine type of diamond coating on the top as well as a more conventional coating. Uh, diamond coatings are not all the same. There are a number of different ways to do that. And the coating that we have developed and the method that we use produces an extremely uniform type of diamond crystal. As opposed to the one on the bottom, if you look closely, if it shows up well enough on the screen, you'll see a variety of crystal sizes. There are large ones next to small ones and so forth. And that has negative implications for a number of reasons. The smooth surface is superior in that it resists built-up edge. Remember that soft matrix may be possibly melting under high temperatures. Well, you can imagine with an aggressive surface on the bottom there, it is going to be apt to stick to or build up to that surface. Uh, the chip flow is going to be more effective over a smooth surface. And of course, uh, if we have a very small and uniform grain size, that allows for those individual crystals to not necessarily be subjected to any stress risers or force. If you have a whole bunch of small crystal and one large crystal on the coating, that one is going to tend to take the brunt of the pressure and be torn free. That initiates failure of the coating. Lastly, uh, I would like to mention that this type of coating can actually be removed. The drill can be reground and reconditioned and it can be recoded. This is something that I really am not aware of anybody else doing at this time. So it, it adds uh, a multiple use feature to any individual tool uh, by reconditioning. If you were to compare two tools here, you can see the difference between the fine diamond coating on the top and the conventional one on the bottom. They literally look night and, night and day different. Uh, the ultra fine crystals are shiny. The conventional coating has a very chalky appearance to it. Uh, so if you ever have the chance to look at them side by side or even feel them, you will be able to easily detect the difference. We've taken a cutting edge here and cross-sectioned it to illustrate several things. Uh, we also transposed a graphical representation of a six micron carbon fiber for consideration. And one thing you'll notice is with any coating, when we apply that to a cutting tool, you are effectively rounding off or dulling the cutting edge. Now in metalworking, that can be advantageous and, and oftentimes that amount of hone or land or radius is, is specifically designed for a material. In our case, we want these tools as sharp as possible, so that means it's important to have a thin coating layer. And it also means that we need to be cognizant of the feed rates at which these tools are applied. You can imagine with the carbon fiber that's on the screen there, if our tool feed rate per revolution is not greater than that radius size, what we're really doing is smashing and pulverizing those ultra hard carbon fibers down into the matrix. At that point, your tool life is gonna suffer dramatically. You're gonna build up a lot of heat. You're gonna have the tendency to do damage to the workpiece or to the holes. Uh, also on the left side of the screen there, uh, showing the fact that we may be machining those fibers from any one of a different direction depending on how the laminate layer has been constructed. Uh, the picture on the bottom is actually quite easy because those fibers are supported well by the matrix and they're sheared off cleanly. The one on the top is a little bit more problematic similar to the videos that we were looking at. So in a nutshell, if we were to summarize drill design and drill selection for composite materials, I would say wherever you can, you want to use a multiple point angle drill with a very thin web to reduce cutting force with a CVD diamond coating to gain that wear resistance that you need. Uh, again, drills with high helix angles are going to produce better hole quality on exit and low helix angles are going to produce a good quality hole both on the entrance side as well as the exit side. 
Next up is milling CFRP, and I know when I first started studying these processes and discussing this with some of my co-workers, the thought was, well, a lot of these materials are going to be cut with a water jet. There's not going to be a lot of milling involved. It's going to come out of a mold. It's going to be trimmed with a water jet. We're going to drill a significantly fewer number of holes than we would compared to, say, an aluminum structure in aerospace. And we're not going to have to really worry about it too much. The reality is, at least in the U.S., uh, I find a tremendous amount of people machining these materials. Uh, some job shops are actually using it just as they would a billet of steel to machine a workpiece out of from scratch. They're not using a pre-molded object and then doing secondary operations. So milling really has been another area where OSG has been doing a lot of R&D and, and trying to, to you know, eke out better tool life and lower cost. From that vantage point, it's really the same as drilling in terms of the basics here. We, again, need that extremely sharp cutting edge. Uh, next up, the wear resistance of the tool has got to be substantial. High-speed steel is not going to work. The chip evacuation or the control of the swarf that we produce, mandatory because, again, it's so abrasive. And then, as always, you can't get away from the need to address or control delamination of the layers of the composite workpiece. So, that considered, lastly, uh, an issue that is quite important in all types of milling, and maybe even more so in composites, is building or designing a tooling geometry that's going to disperse cutting force and be resistant to chipping at the cutting edge. Here's a couple of uh, photos of some work pieces. This is fairly common in the uh, industry. Some folks would call the, the view on the top a brushed edge. I mean, it almost looks like the bristle brush uh, that you might use for cleaning something. And in reality, uh, what you may be looking at there is the combination of several effects. It may be delamination combined with uncut fibers. And then lastly, if you look at the front view or that bottom photograph there, if you imagine an end mill profile milling this, say a conventional end mill, as that matrix is heated up to the point where it becomes um, deposited to the tool, it may travel up along that tool edge and build up on the top of the workpiece. So you could have a number of things producing uh, essentially a very undesirable end result here. So these are some of the more typical defects that we look to address, and we do it, again, with a number of different tool geometries. Some of the tools we manufacture are specials that are made specifically for our customers' demands. They may have a design that's certified that we can't vary from, uh, and we do that quite often, but we have worked with a number of manufacturers. In this case, we refer to this tool as our Boeing design. It's a serrated style rougher designed by the Boeing Corporation. We're licensed to produce and sell it here in the States. And it is diamond coated for wear resistance. You'll notice that the helix angles of the flute are opposed by the helical angles of the serrations or the nicks in that tool, again, to hold those layers together instead of tearing them apart. Uh, those nicks, uh, the high spots anyways, have facets to them which allow a better quality surface finish because as each flute comes around, those serrations are staggered and those facets clean up whatever high spots are left and as well as reducing the tool pressure that we were talking about earlier. Uh, one of the most difficult parts of any milling application is the amount of tool pressure and power that's required to actually shear a material. It's magnified in composites, so this gives us a tool that quite possibly certainly be applied, applicable as a rougher uh, or a rougher semi-finisher, but a lot of folks are using them as a two-shot tool, rough and finish. They find they can meet their surface finish requirements by simply using this design alone. Next up would be our herringbone router. Some people refer to these as compression routers or compression mills, and it's pretty notable when you look at that and, and see two opposing helix angles there. The bottom or the tip of that tool would extend slightly below the workpiece, that helix angle trying to lift up on the bottom composite layer. The opposing helix is going to actually be pressing down on the top of the workpiece again, trying to, to control the forces that, that either tear apart or sandwich those layers together. Principally a finishing tool. Now, of course, I come from a job shop environment, and you know the old adage, you do what you got to do. I find people attempting to do all sorts of crazy stuff with these things, burying them, slotting them, large depths of cut. Depending on your, your machine conditions, you may get away with that, but principally a finishing tool or a semi-finishing tool, particularly for panel trimming, where you're just machining the outside edge of an object. Pretty simple. Summarizing the milling tools, the 
features or design specifics that we target for an efficient tool is really going to be dictated by the process details of the manufacturing application at hand. So again, the production methods are going to, you know, in, in effect, select the tool for you.